Hi, this is Jim from Trek World. Welcome to the third part in our exclusive series covering the fans who had interactions with the Galileo as she worked her way from the West Coast to the East Coast during a five-decade-long adventure. We'll introduce you to the man who owned her from 1985 to 1989. We'll share stories and photos from the 20th anniversary Star Trek convention in 1986. And we'll also show you exclusive, never-before-available photos from a public appearance of the Galileo at the first weekend of the Star Trek IV theater release. And finally, we'll introduce you to some folks who made an offer on the Galileo for ownership and the bizarre series of events that followed. So join me after the break as we continue to explore the fascinating world of Star Trek fandom and the people who occupy it. Please be sure to check out these other popular Trek World videos when you're finished with this one. Also, if you hit that little like button on the screen right now, you will be helping YouTube to show it to more people and give them a chance to discover these unique and fascinating videos as well. Do you have a story, photo, or video that you would like to share with us? If so, you can submit via our internet dropbox at submit.trek-world.com. Welcome back to the third video in our series of experiences of everyday fans as they came in contact with the Galileo over the years. Now, when we last left the Galileo in part two, she was sitting at Rebel Mini Storage in Carson, California. For the last 10 years or so, she had been owned by Roger Heisman. If you've missed earlier videos in this series, I placed a link right up here in the top right hand corner for you to check them out in order. Meanwhile, back in 1985, there was a chance encounter in which Heisman mentioned in passing that he owned the Galileo and wanted to sell it. The other party contacted their brother, a man named Steve Haskins, and a deal to buy the Galileo for $1,800 was quickly made. Afterwards, Haskins moved the Galileo into the San Diego area, where, in a true case of deja vu, it sat on his driveway as he began the work that would return the Galileo to her former glory. Now, in Starlog issue 112, they put in an interview with Steve Haskins that had been done at the 20th anniversary convention in Anaheim. Unfortunately, like many other magazines in the same period, Starlog would rarely check on the facts before printing them. They often simply printed whatever information was told to them by their subject. This became less of a problem in later years, but it was still a concern well after issue 112. Now, over the years, this has contributed greatly to the confusion over what really happened in the original Star Trek series. Even worse, today these articles are still referenced by modern websites and wikis as authoritative sources for information. The first case of this can be illustrated by them saying that the Galileo cost $65,000, when in reality it was only $24,000 split 50-50 between Desilu and AMT. Furthermore, they credited the American Machine and Foundry Company, which was best known for almost destroying the Harley-Davidson brand in the 1970s and 80s, with the origin of the Galileo, when in fact, it was the Aluminum Model Toys Company. Steve also went on in the article to describe how he needed to have a custom trailer built to move the Galileo. Now, up to this point, every time it needed to be moved, it was hauled up on a flatbed truck to be able to do it. His solution would be far more convenient as the Galileo no longer needed to be removed from the trailer for display. Now, he further goes on to mention his intent to donate the restored craft to the California Museum of Science and Technology. He would repeatedly attempt to get them to accept the Galileo, even going so far as circulating a petition. Unfortunately, the end result was the museum wasn't interested in the Galileo as they did not see its value as a fictional prop. So, and then finally, Steve mentions that he had several volunteers to help him finish the restoration, which also included restoring the interior as well. I think that's important for us to note here. These exclusive photos were given to a gentleman named David Silver by Steve Haskins about 40 years ago. David has kept them in his private collection until he chose to share them with us. In these photos, you can actually see the incredible job that Steve did in less than one year's time. This final morph does a really good job of illustrating the remarkable progress that Steve and his family had done in that time frame. Now, by this time, in addition to the $1,800 he had given Heisman, he spent about $8,500 on the restoration. That would be the equivalent today of around $25,000. Now, sponsored jointly by Creation Entertainment and Starlog Magazine, the 20th anniversary Star Trek convention was held in Anaheim at the Disneyland Hotel. They expected 
around 2,000 people to attend. But they actually had about 6,000 people actually show up before the weekend was over. And one of the very first comments to come from attending that particular convention came from Terry Pold, who actually celebrated his birthday at the convention. But it was his anecdote that stuck out in my mind most of all as I collected info on this particular convention. It appears that they celebrated that weekend by opening a bottle of champagne. When they popped the cork, it ricocheted off the ceiling and Terry caught it. He says he still has that cork to this day. Now, in addition to some footage of the yet-to-be-released Star Trek IV, they presented here for the very first time the Galileo in an enclosed public area exclusively for attendees. Now, as a result of news coverage of this, many fans believe that this was the shuttle's first appearance after it had been restored, and they had no idea it had been previously displayed at Kobe's in San Diego. Unfortunately, I haven't found anyone who was at Kobe's, let alone photos or videos of the event. Now, among those who attended the convention was a young man by the name of Guy Jackson. He took a series of photos and was kind enough to submit them to us through our Dropbox at submit.trekworld.com. Note that in this unusual photo from a convention, the interior of the Galileo is actually lit, resulting in the light reflections that we see through the impulse engine's cutouts. So here's another shot of the interior lighting shining out through the impulse engine cutouts. I was kind of surprised that Guy was the only person to mention this to me, but he noticed that the dash between NCC and 1701 was only present on the Galileo's left or port side. Now, at first glance, that would appear to have been a mistake, but I do have to point out the obvious connection here between the three-quarter scale Galileo and the 24-inch Galileo that was used for filming. Due to an issue with the decal sheets shown here that Richard Dayton had produced, the exact same issue existed on the 24-inch filming miniature. In fact, it would not be corrected until several more years later when Star Trek The Next Generation had the 24-inch model refurbished to be used as a prop model in one scene's background. So, in my opinion, and yes, this is just my opinion, Haskins was way too detail-oriented to make this kind of mistake and not correct it. So, I believe that Haskins deliberately duplicated the error in order to stay 100% prop accurate. Now, also present on this exact same weekend was another viewer, David Gaxiola. He was kind enough to also provide some photos from his encounter, and we'll start here with a few photos before we get into the Galileo pictures. On the right was obviously Majel Barrett. Jean was to be there that weekend as well, but Majel not only signed autographs, she was also a vendor representing Lincoln Enterprises in the dealer room. Now on the left is a picture of a very young David. If we pull back a little bit, we'll get a better look at their surroundings. Notice the travel tarp that's draped over the custom-made trailer that Steve had built. In most photos from this convention, that tarp is not there, implying that this picture was taken early on the first day of the con, even before the photos that we just saw from Guy Jackson. Now, earlier we had said that Starlog reported that Steve had found a group of willing fans to help him with the restoration. Be that as it may, in reality, that detail fell to one man, Carlos Rivera. Steve had met Carlos at the convention, and Carlos volunteered to help Haskins out with the restoration, and subsequently did the bulk of the restoration work from this point forward, moving the shuttle in November to yet another open storage space, this time in Thousand Palms. Now, unfortunately, no photos or videos seem to originate from the time that the Galileo was in Thousand Palms, and everyone that I asked, including people that still live in the area today, they were not aware it had been in Thousand Palms, and so as a result, they didn't even have stories to give me. Now, I do have to point out that our next stop comes to you as a result of a comment left on the original video from Carlos himself. He recounted a public showing at the Century Theater in Palm Desert, California. This was the first time we've been given the exact name and location of that showing. I had known about it through Urban Legend, but could not get it validated. He mentioned that the local TV station, KESQ, had recorded a piece on the showing. But when I contacted a producer at the station, they told me they didn't keep any tapes from that period of time and that it couldn't provide any more information. However, in discussion about a different Galileo topic, 
David Silver mentioned to me that he had attended the premiere for Star Trek The Wrath of Khan that had the Galileo outside. Okay, well, since Star Trek II was released in 1982, I immediately suspected he had the wrong movie, but he had the right event. In fact, his photos were from the 1986 premiere of Star Trek IV. And since then, I have verified that these were indeed the photos I had been looking for. Now, here we see the Galileo when faced from the bow. Note that you can see the trailer hitch easily in this photo. They even used it to hold up their sign. Shown here are David Carlos and Carlos's son. Another angle with Carlos and his son. Note the missing dash that we talked about on the registry. It's clearly visible here that it's not there. Here we have a full starboard profile. And from this view, you can still see some of the touch-up prime paint that Carlos had used on the inside of the port rear wall. Also, if you look very closely, you will notice the small hole that had been drilled into the side of the Galileo towards the front of the nacelles. This is where Roger Heisman had passed his power cords from outside to the inside of the cabin for its overhead lights. In our previous video, we actually saw footage that was filmed at Rebel Mini Storage, and if you look at it, you can still see the cable hanging limply to the ground. Now, this shot provides us a much better view of the custom-made sign that Carlos had made. Now, unfortunately, the quality of the old photo distorts when enlarged, so it's not really possible to make out any of the details concerning the photos that he had taped on the board. And now we have a full port profile to match the starboard profile we saw just a few moments. Now here we have a small family grouping in the interior of the Galileo. Unfortunately, no one took any photos showing the rear of the interior at this point. I would have been fascinated to get an idea of how far along they were at reconstructing the rear wall and door. Now as we get ready to take our leave of this particular night, I wanted to call out a point made in an earlier video that I had done. Note that the rear roof is supported by a 2x4, which protrudes through one of the rear impulse vents. This confirms my earlier observation in another previous video, as well as echoing what Racer X had said in his story. So after a while, Carlos had to move the Galileo again, this time to another lot in Palm Springs. This is where the Galileo would sit for several years awaiting its next fateful step. Now, after it had been brought into Palm Springs and sat for a few years, someone actually did bother to take a photograph of the rear interior of the Galileo to give us an idea of exactly how far along that wall was. You can clearly see the 2x4 through the interior door, but by this point... The 2x4 has been attached to an internal strut connected to the lower rear bulkhead. This allows them to secure the roof while ensuring that the brace does not pass through the impulse fence. Now, the next set of photos were taken in the late 1980s, probably around 88 or 89. We're going to look at a few of these photos as the condition of the Galileo would deteriorate at this point onward for about another two decades or so. This series of photos gives us a good look at the bow of the Galileo. Here we see the rear of the Galileo. Notice that the 2x4 is still in place. Now, shortly after 1989, the 2x4 would be removed and the roof will begin to collapse one more time. And here we have some really good shots of the starboard side of Galileo, complete with a missing dash in the registry. And here we have a good look at the port side of Galileo, complete with the door being open. And finally, we get a good set of close-up photos of the nacelles and the wings. And yeah, I know they're not wings, but they look like wings to me. So unfortunately, it's the first thing that came to mind. Our next story comes from Russ Haslidge of the International Federation of Trekkers in Ohio. Russ wrote and told me the following. In 1985, the Federation contacted Stephen Haskins, who was a law student at the time, and we made a deal to buy the shuttlecraft from him for $1,500. He agreed, and I sent my VP out to assess the situation. As part of that deal, we immediately assumed the payment for storage fees while we were figuring out how to transport the Galileo from here to Ohio. Now, one of the hurdles in getting the Galileo from California to Ohio is that the trailer was not able to be used. By this time, it had sand in the axle, and you were just going to have to use a trucking company to move it. So they were looking for a trucking company to work with them to find a way to get the Galileo onto a flatbed, then home to Ohio. They were already working on that at this point. Now, these photos were taken by the VP of the group who had driven straight through all night from Ohio to California. 
Notice Carlos Rivera in the photo. He was there to facilitate an inspection of the Galileo as part of the sales deal. However, things were destined to spin out of control not long afterwards. Now, unfortunately, as we've all heard before, possession is nine-tenths of the law. They had a verbal agreement, but they had not actually paid for the Galileo by the time that they attended a Star Trek convention in Cleveland and announced their agreement to buy the Galileo. But while they were waiting to arrange transportation for the Galileo to be moved, it was announced that Steve Haskins had sold the Galileo to a lady from Ohio. Now, the Federation never received any formal or even an informal notice of the sale. They actually even continued to pay the storage fees until they found out, after the fact, that their verbal agreement would not be honored, nor would they get their money back from the storage fees. So obviously the incident left a sore spot with the Federation that is still akin to somewhat of an open wound even today. So after talking to Russ, I've come to the opinion that the Federation is probably one of the most progressive charitable organizations I've seen started by the fans and taking care of the community. Now, for more information on the Federation, please check out our PSA on the International Federation of Trekkers. And coming soon, exclusively for members of the Trek World Channel, we will be releasing Galileo, the complete story, and then some. This will be the longest aired documentary ever produced for the Galileo. Now, please be on the lookout for the next video in this series for stories you will not want to miss. We meet the next owner of the Galileo, who will end up owning it for longer than anyone else. We'll talk about how the Galileo seemingly disappeared and the internet sleuths who stopped at nothing to find out what happened. We will see the amazing Cinderella story of the Galileo as she goes from the worst physical condition of her life to being fully and beautifully restored as well as how she rubbed elbows with the Space Shuttle Enterprise and where she is right now. Please be sure to check out these other popular Trek World videos when you're finishing this one. Also, if you hit that like button on the screen right now, you'll be helping YouTube to show this video to more people and give them a chance to discover these unique and fascinating videos as well.